Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash Ask Psych Sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash Ask Psych Sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thank you for joining us. My guest today is Dr. Ani Rogers from Northwestern University. Thanks for being with us today, Ani. Thanks so much for having me. Before we get started, I like my guests to let the listeners know a bit about themselves. So if you could tell us about your training, um, your research area, what you're teaching, and anything else you think would be helpful for context setting, that would be super. Sure. Um, so yes, I'm an assist, um, associate professor now at Northwestern University, and I was trained as a developmental psychologist. So I did my undergraduate training at UCLA, and then I did my PhD work at New York University. And I was trained in a school of education, so um, specifically culture, context, and human development. Um, <clears throat> but my degree is in developmental psych. And so from the beginning of my training, it was really rooted in thinking about kids in context and families in context. And so that's definitely been a core um, feature or approach to the way I, I pursue developmental science. And my work has focused largely on children's identity development. So asking how kids understand who they are, um, how they make sense of who they want to become, and really um, how they engage with society's sort of norms and expectations, the sort of stories and scripts that society has for us, particularly around our social groups, such as race and gender. Um, So, you know, how kids understand what does it mean to be a girl? Like what what are those boundaries and expectations? And then what does it mean for me? And how do I grapple with um, my identity within some of these um, restrictions, honestly, and and, um, contradictions? And so that's the the crux of my work. And I advise students, undergraduates, through postdocs, um, all who are interested in various aspects or facets of identity. So we do gender and race and social class and um, language and sexuality and sort of all the different sort of group identities you could think of in a way um, from childhood up through the college age. Great. Thank you. And let's take a moment to pause and congratulate that title change from assistant to associate professor. That's wonderful. <laughs> thank um, you. It takes some getting used to. <laughs> yes. Practice, practice. So it flows off the tongue. Okay. Um, well, I got in touch with you because I read the Springtide Mental Health and Gen Z report, which uh, features you. So I recommend our listeners get their hands on that and read it and think through what your um, the culture and context of your spaces are. Um, and so what I was hoping we could talk about um, was kind of bringing maybe some of these pieces together. Well, first, I want to acknowledge that it sounds like you've been working for a long time on this idea of culture and context and cognitive psychology has been a little slower to, to hop on the bandwagon. So thank you for uh, giving us work on which to build. Uh, so why don't we start with talking kind of where you just left off, which is that you are supervising from undergraduate through postdoc and teaching doesn't just happen in the classroom. It also happens in that space. So would you be willing to tell our listeners a bit about how you think about uh, research from a teaching lens and from the um, if it as relevant the your own research questions influencing, I'm guessing, how then you approach a research lab. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say um definitely it was one of those uh sort of epiphanies, if you will, that I stumbled across a few years then, recognizing that I'm teaching, you know, in the classroom, of course, but also a lot of my teaching happens in our research lab and through my research team. Um and through doing the sorts of um research projects that we do. So we have undergrads in the lab, graduate students and postdocs. And um, what's great about that space is research, of course, is designed to be about curiosity and sort of following one's curiosity in a meaningful way. And if we think about what that means in a classroom, it should be very similar. (laughs) Um, But it feels very explicit and intentional in research. And so, you know, our research lab, we... um, meet every week as a team. And that has become a really important feature of building community 
things that I prioritize in, in thinking about my lab um, include that sort of consistent meeting time where we come together to share ideas and build relationship to uh, the diversity of our lab. So we've got students from all different racial and ethnic backgrounds, economic backgrounds, um, different majors. So I've got students who are in journalism and sociology as mm -hmm. well as psychology and education, right? So diverse perspectives around the table. Um, I must always have students who are non-traditional students in some capacity. So students who are doing a post bac program or who are working full time and thinking about going back to school, right? So different perspectives in that way as well. Um, and that's something I think very intentionally about as we, um, as we build our lab and, and make transitions. Um, and then the other thing I would say is uh, it's very explicit and intentional for RAs in the lab when they join, I tell them, you're not here to do a bunch of tasks. You're here to think and contribute, mm -hmm. right? So just setting that expectation that I'm not, um, you know, the ruler of this space and I'm going to be doling out tasks, but it's like, here's a question, here's a problem, here's the data set. Um, and you're expected to show up with ideas and questions and challenges and curiosities and solutions and suggestions, right? And so um, <clears throat> that I think really engages students in the process and becomes integral to building community, but also facilitating their learning, right? The students, I feel like, really get into research in a way that um, they may not otherwise, right? And students were like, I never thought research was for me. Um, and so to be in this space, it's like, it's not only for me, it's about me. And it's like really interesting. So um, uh, those principles that sort of guide the research lab um, have influenced the way I think about my teaching in the classroom as well, right? Like, are we thinking about diverse perspectives? Who's being centered and who's left out? Um, am, am I doing sort of instruction and teaching that calls for students to think and critique and to be curious? Do they have opportunities to do more than sort of repeat back the, the right answers, right? Um, and so I think that has definitely influenced and shaped the teaching that I do in the classroom as well. Thank you. That so often happens. I have to decide what I want to ask for a follow up because I want to follow up on a lot of a lot of pieces. So uh, maybe I'll start practical. Um, I am not sure all of us on the call were trained in having a lab that way. Um, you know, the complete academic definitely says students should get something more than what a robot could get out of coming in. Press the run button on E Prime. Right, it's literally a picture of someone running. Press that button, walk away, come back in. So. Uh, Maybe you were trained with this really great background, but if we weren't, how do we sort of um, move in that way? I'm thinking especially if I, I think I could do it fairly easily. You're giving me ideas, but I'm also leveled up to full professor. I'm so impressed that you did this while you were under the stress and pressure of being an assistant professor who needs to publish, I'm guessing needs to get grant funding. So yeah, do you want to just, that, that's a lot of words. Do you have any response? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I was trained, my my graduate advisor was very um, engaged in that way, run her lab meetings in a way that was like, everyone's at the table for a reason. <laughs> she sometimes did it in a little bit of a scarier way, like we'd be sitting there and she'd be like, Ani, what are you thinking? And I'm like, uh, what am I thinking? Um, but like, you knew that was coming always to anyone, right? Like, so it was like, genuinely, like, I want to know what everyone around the table is thinking. Um, so I definitely got that from, from her. Uh, but I think to your point of like, how does one do this under the pressure of publishing? So I think it's two things. One is, um, I think it does depend a bit on the kind of research you do and how you think about research. Um, <clears throat> so, I do qualitative research mostly. Most all my work is interview based. We do have surveys as well. And we do a lot of um, sort of descriptive analyses. I don't run experiments, um, so that's just like a different type of research. Um, but also related to the how and my methodology is the what. So studying identity. Um, one could say it's easy <laughs> to connect to, to people because, which I think is true of almost all of research, but certainly identity. I'm like, everyone has an identity. 
you're studying gender and you have a gender, right? Like all of this is not just like, what are you learning about that kid or this sample? But like, what are you learning about you? How does this show up in your life? So we do a lot of that sort of critical self-reflection as well, which becomes integral to, to the analysis and then sort of how I think students get engaged in research and recognizing these aren't just like topics over there. This is like, we're studying humans and surprise, surprise, we're all human. <laughs> um, so there's that, I think that's important. And then the last piece I would add is um, how we think about the research process and who's capable of engaging in research and who's not, and sort of how we structure it. So we tend to think of like a, more of a hierarchy, like most mm -hmm. things in our society, right? Like, you know, you've got the PI and then you've got postdocs and you've got some grad students, and then you got your undergrads and then you got your first year undergrads, right? Like, and so your first year in the lab, you get to do A. And then maybe you are mature enough to do B or C, right? There's sort of a lineage. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's, it's a structure that comes with, I think, assumptions about what one is capable to contribute. And so, um, A, building a lab community for me was essential. Like, that's where I do my thinking. We don't understand the world in isolation. I can't read and interpret all this data just in my own head. I need conversation with people, right? So it was a necessity. And then secondly, I've published with my undergrads. They contribute to every part of the research, you know, and I submitted my tenure packet. I think I had at least three, maybe four journal articles, peer review articles that had undergraduate students as co-authors. They were there for coding and, you know, preliminary presentations at conferences and then moving that all the way forward to a publication and going through the rejection process and the revise and resubmit and, right. But those are students who came into the lab without prior experience um, and within three or four years are contributing to a manuscript. And that shouldn't be shocking. Like that shouldn't feel impossible and it shouldn't feel like just the exceptional. So I think coming in with the expectation that your students are, you know, brilliant contributors. Now I can only speak to my students. I'm not going to say every student all around in every setting. Definitely, we've got some remarkable students here, but it has been across the board. We get fantastic research assistants who are really great thinkers and collaborators. And so part of the reason I was able to get tenure, honestly, is building a really rich and meaningful research community that included undergraduate students. Great. Thank you. I was a very helpful and motivating answer. So I, I appreciate those those perspectives. And I keyed in on a word that I know if you did a content analysis of my podcast does not come up enough, and that is the qualitative research. So would you mind taking a minute or two to give me the cell, which I could use for myself, about maybe why we should be broadening out of being so, I will say for myself as an experimental cognitive psychologist, I'm so quantitative that I, I'm not sure... I could give an appropriate definition of a qualitative analysis without accidentally making it quantitative. So, yeah, you're not alone. I mean, it's something like less than, oh, I think it's less than 5% um, of doctorate programs in psychology even have qualitative methods as part of their training, which is really shocking and disappointing um, when you think about. Uh, what it means to be studying humans, right? Psychology studies humans. Um, and we're obviously very complex and dynamic. Um, but there is, you know, sort of the longstanding um, assumption, if you will, or privileging of, you know, the cognitive and um, numerical representation of the world um, as true, and honest and objective. Um, and that objectivity piece is where everything falls apart, I would say. So qualitative work is subject to subjectivities and biases um, in ways that we think are invisible in our quantitative work. That's just not true. So, um, you know, the reality is we're humans studying humans. So we all have our subjectivities and biases and that's baked into every question and measure and method and analysis that we do. Um, I would say main difference 
in qualitative research is that that becomes central to the structure and approach that like we have subjectivities, we have a positionality, we have an identity and a lived experience in the world. What does that mean for how we're doing the work? So it's more front and center. Um, if I take a step back to your actual question, it's like, what is qualitative? Um, you know, the most basic I teach, um, of course, and, um, it's called evaluating evidence and it's about like empirical methods and uh, social sciences. And so quantitative research is numbers and qualitative research is words, <laughs> right? We've got images or words or text of some form. Um, and then the analysis piece um, <clears throat> to your point, like we can quantify qualitative things and assign numbers to them and values, right? And sort of do a quantitative analysis of something that was once qualitative. Um, or we can do a qualitative analysis, which, you know, there's entire handbooks on different types of um, analytic methods for working with non-numerical data. Um, <clears throat> so coding for themes and identifying patterns. Um, you're looking for, um, you know, the ways that particular stories in our data, right? We're asking kids about who they are. So we listen to what is the story they tell about who they are, who they want to be, who they can't be, given society's constraints and restrictions, right? How do they navigate that? And so we're listening to themes and stories within an interview as well as across an interview um, within a whole sample. And then we use that sort of qualitative analysis to generate insights that are about like, how do kids negotiate what it means to be black in this society? How are they understanding it? Um, is this about their skin color? Is it about their family relationships? Is it about experiences of discrimination and exclusion? Is it about opportunity? Like what are the things that seem to be, um, you know, creating the boundaries or contours of one's identity? Um, and so qualitative work, in that way, when we're doing qualitative analysis, involves a lot of um, reading and rereading and, and conversations, right? Where we're saying, what do you see? What do you hear? I hear this. Do you see that? Show me where that is in the data. Like, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think the kid said that, right? Like, how do we stay close to the data and what they're saying? Um, and so then, again, that's why uh, doing this work in community becomes so important. Great. Thank you. And thank you for the reminder that none of us are that objective, right? Even if we, when we, when we think we are, I think that's the, that's a good piece uh, to, to keep in mind. I know I have some data that is definitely qualitative. So I'm going to find one of those handbooks and look through it because it also seems like you'll get information that would be lost if you don't do it that way, right? It's very rich. Those stories are rich, right? It's not, I don't want to read a journal article that says, you know, 10 of your 12 uh, participants described to being black as meaning X and four out of 12 meant Y, right? That feels like, especially if we want to use any kind of anti-racist lens, like that's not how we're going to make people anti-racist. Like I'd like that count to get to four. Right. Yeah. I mean, and to the point of, I didn't quite answer this part of your question, which was, you know, why should we be using more of these methodologies, which, you know, in my own work, even using qualitative research has been the gateway into new ideas. Because if you think about it, when we have an existing measure, we're only going to get what we've asked. It's not possible to know what we don't know because we already have the questions set, right? So when you do an interview, we have our questions and then they respond. Um, and so an example is a piece we did um, was published last year that was looking at Black girls' um, narratives of racial and gender identity. And what we found was like all of the girls were, so many of the girls were mentioning hair. And I had a graduate student at the time who was interested in, in hair and, and phenotype. And so we ended up doing this systematic analysis of hair engines. And it was a sample of 60 something, almost 70 girls, and all but one spontaneously mentioned hair in the interview. And almost all of those were in the context of answering questions about what it means to be Black. And what it means to be a black girl. And so then we did this really beautiful analysis, honestly, um, about how hair is central to experiences of discrimination, experiences of oppression, as well as um, tools of resistance. Like, this is how I show who I am. This is how I claim my identity, right? And 
you know, we have an entire developmental literature on racial identity, and none of it includes hair. None of it conceptualizes the way this shapes and helps girls like articulate and explain what it means to be a black girl in the world. And so we didn't have a question about hair. We don't have a measure about hair. Um, and so we need qualitative methods so that we can make space for the experiences and perspectives that honestly are just invisible in our existing structures and measures and sort of approaches. Thank you. That is... That's so much. So I'm pausing because I can't. It's like, what adjective do I even want here? Um, what a great reminder, right? If you just came at the data with your aggressive hierarchical thing, we would lose what's incredibly important. And I think especially when you're studying identity. And I think that for those of us who are teachers, I hope that we want students' full identities to be recognized and honored in the sense of belonging in a classroom. We want to know what to what to look for. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for all of this. But I do always like to close by letting my guests talk about something we didn't get to because, right, I don't know what you would have liked me to ask. So is there something that you um, would like our listeners to sort of know or consider either in thinking about their teaching or thinking about their labs or thinking about something else that you think would be helpful? Um, oh, what a nice way to end. Um, and it's not unlike how we end our interviews. We like at the end, we always say, is there anything else you want to add or talk about? Um, <clears throat> so I guess I would just say, you know, looping things back to the Springtide report and thinking about um, students' mental health in the classrooms. And, um, you know, part of that report, which is so beautiful, I do encourage folks to to um, look it up and, and engage with that. Um <clears throat> is the reality is young people are incredibly anxious right now and their mental health is really struggling and sort of the the pace and demands of school and and you know extracurricular activities and <laughs> resume building and like all of the things um it's a lot it's a lot while the world you know continues to melt down and i think that that is especially true when we think about these identities and positionalities that our students have Right, that each student walking into our classroom, depending on where, where you teach, um, but you know, in, in a lot of spaces, students are coming from very different backgrounds and positionalities, like you know, and, and what they're doing or experiencing at home and in their home life, but also as we think about society, right? So that you know, um, I was teaching during spring 2020 in the heat of that pandemic. <laughs> shut down and then the murder of George Floyd. And I mean, let me tell you, it was impacting everyone, but what it meant for me to be in a classroom with two other young black men, right? Like that's a very specific encounter with showing up to class all the world, right? And so just being mindful that like what's happening out there in society, we're collectively experiencing it, but also uniquely. And so how can you be attentive and sensitive to what it might look and feel like to be, you know, entering into a classroom in the midst of, you know, really intense um, sociopolitical upheaval. Um, and, and then I would say what I talk about in the report that I think is my own learning has been very useful is to just sort of make space for um, your classroom climate, your classroom values, your classroom instruction to center the humanity of your students, mm -hmm. um, you know, to respect their knowledge and curiosity, to make space for them to uh, really engage in your, in your class and not feel like it's another space where there's all of these demands and constant evaluation and not a space to be, to think, to be curious, to question, right? That I found that by, reducing the demands and expectations students you know blow my mind in terms of their engagement and participation you know i say you don't have to come to lecture that, you know it's fine i'm not going to take attendance you're not going to get points and students come to lecture because it's like you know they want to be there so how can you think about not how do i make sure students don't skip class but how do i create a learning environment where students want to show up Right. So like just flipping those questions, I think, has been really powerful for 
for me and asking like, but why do I care if they come to election? Like, why does it matter? <laughs> I don't actually, except that I want them to want to come, right? And so then that's where I put my energy. Great. That is, I'm like, hmm, I'm going to take some stuff out of my syllabus. It's only week three. I bet, I bet no one would complain. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for your input. And this was a delightful conversation. I feel like we could have talked for hours, but I will respect that this is a short form podcast. I have been uh, having the delightful uh, opportunity to chat with Dr. Ani Rogers from Northwestern University. Take care. Thank you so much. Listeners, did today's episode make you realize you have a question you would like someone to answer? I would be happy to take it into consideration and find a guest that can help. But what I need you to do is head over to our Google form at bit.ly slash ask psych sessions.